Welcome back to another edition of Forecast Lab. It is a fairly quiet weather pattern across the country this afternoon. And looking out there in the Atlantic, we are in the midst of hurricane season. A little bit of thunder out there. We're in the midst of hurricane season, but not much on the horizon. Yeah, let's just jump straight away to that. The next seven days looking clear out there in the Atlantic. This is what I call the detrimental effects chart. Looking out there in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, this gives us an idea of the potential for tropical cyclone development. I don't think these charts exist anywhere on the internet, so yeah, come here and get those. We see that there is a lot of shear indicated by the bluish colors and a lot of dry, low, and mid-level air indicated by the browns. So quite a bit of problems, and as you go north, you get into the strong prevailing westerlies, which is an anomalous pattern for this time of year. Going forward in time, looks like a lot of Saharan air mass working out there, kind of uh, mixing things up. We do see that things improve out there in the Caribbean going into midweek, but up to the north, still under the influence of that strong atmospheric shear pretty much anywhere from Cuba, Dominican Republic, northward. But looks like things may be improving a little bit. So we will have to watch that area from the Cape Verde Islands to the Leeward Islands. Here is the conventional surface map everybody is familiar with. Some big changes coming in from the northwestern U.S. That is a strong thickness gradient indicating a strong thermal contrast. That's a pocket of strong Pacific, I should say North Pacific air coming onto the coast of Oregon and Washington. Those temperatures rather cool, 62 at Portland, 56 at Seattle, and anomalously cold conditions in the San Joaquin Valley, temperatures in the 70s this afternoon. Typically, we would see 85 to 95, maybe even 100s. So in between, we've got this cold front dividing the semi-tropical air in Utah from the cooler air to the west. Elsewhere around the country, also some anomalous weather there in the Texas Panhandle, getting some downslope flow. Temperatures coming up to 105, 110 at Childress with a dry line starting the setup around Abilene. Tropical air in Texas, and then as you go to the north and the northeast, this is a residual polar air mass. That's an old Canadian air mass that has sunk south out of the Great Lakes area, Ontario, Manitoba. And we can look at the dew points to get an idea of the source region. Dew points in the 50s in Georgia, that's going to be an old polar air mass for sure. You don't develop 50s dew points out there in the Gulf of Mexico and the southern North Atlantic. In the northeastern U.S., we can see immediately from the satellite loop that we have northwesterly flow. This time of year, that tends to be associated with cold advection, and that means kind of a unstable condition because you have cooler air being advected over relatively warm terrain, and you get this destabilization, extensive towering cumulus, and low top cumulonimbus, and we've certainly got that going on. Burlington down to Boston, although it is evaporating, and inland around Binghamton, Albany, the convection is a little bit more persistent. In the southeastern states, we have a stagnant frontal boundary stretched across northern Florida. Extensive convection associated with that front with a combination of sea breezes across the Florida peninsula. Inland, we've got the drier air from Canada, and that's tending to suppress convection. Continued hot in Texas, as mentioned, the flow has turned more southwesterly on the Caprock. Temperatures expected to be around 110 degrees from Childress to Wichita Falls, DFW expecting 101. A few thunderstorms developing southeast of Dallas, all the way down towards the College Station area. And further to the west, a large heat advisory covering much of the state with excessive heat warnings from Dallas out towards Abilene, Wichita Falls, Ardmore, and Childress, of course. In the northern plains, a marginal risk for severe thunderstorms. In the central 
and northern High Plains, basically this area right here, already some convection developing around the Black Hills into southeastern Montana. Strong wind gusts and isolated small hail are possible. And we go west and we get into a more dynamic weather pattern. We've got the coupling of the strong prevailing westerlies with enhanced southerly flow west of the large subtropical high. Let me show that to you on the upper level chart. Sometimes it helps to be able to see these things. There's that strong troughing in the northwestern U.S. There's the subtropical high centered across Oklahoma City, Amarillo, and Dallas. And in between, stronger southwesterly and westerly flow all the way from New Mexico back towards Oregon. And of course, as you get closer to that upper level low, you get the effects of cold core convection, minus 20 Celsius at 500 millibars in western Oregon. So this time of year, that's going to be a fairly unstable weather pattern. As for this afternoon, we've got red flag warnings and wind advisories through the entire Great Basin area. Focusing on this region right here, we pick up the wind warnings in western Utah. Winds will be as high as 55 miles an hour there. Ely, Dugway Proving Ground, Wendover, Salt Lake City. And just out to the east, we can see the combination of moisture with that destabilization producing numerous showers and storms all the way from the central Utah mountains northward. And as we go northwestward, you can see that dynamic weather pattern, cold core low in Oregon, the combination of moisture and instability out there in eastern Idaho and southwestern Montana. And that's going to be associated with this developing complex moving to the northeast. There's one last look at that weather in the northwestern U.S., the main Bear Clinic zone in western Montana, where we have those severe hazards. And as you go further to the west, that's going to be under the influence of that occlusion. All right, let's head into Hawaii. They do have a tropical storm watch posted for the Big Island due to the approach of, I think that's going to be Hone. Not sure how you pronounce that, but that's it right there. 40 knots, and that's going to be grazing the island. Let's show you the track on that. Passing just to the south, they will pick up gusts 40 to 50 miles an hour in the lower elevations, above 50 miles an hour at Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa. And we may see some flooding through the weekend across much of that island. Further north... Continued stormy in Alaska itself. No big problems this afternoon. Rather cool with 40s all the way to Fairbanks. Kind of a dismal afternoon there. They have had heavy rains in the interior. Parts of the Kuskokwim River cresting above the 10-year record for today. The Koyukuk River is at bank full due to that ongoing extensive drainage from the Brooks Range and the interior. Heading into the Canadian Arctic, not much to report on. Cool, very seasonal conditions. And down south in Canada itself, we're seeing mostly air quality advisories in central Manitoba, northeastern Saskatchewan due to lingering wildfire smoke. And in southeastern British Columbia, we have a severe thunderstorm watch extending all the way to the U.S. border due to the potential for large hail and heavy rains. Well, here's one chart that we have not really looked at recently, the precipitable water. This is a measure of how much rain would fall if you could squeeze out the entire atmosphere. So we do have a very moist air mass across Texas, precipitable water about two inches, which is maybe a little bit on the high side for this time of year. Not really all that surprising though. And we've got 1.5 all the way to South Dakota. Along the Gulf Coast, near and south of that frontal zone, widespread 1.5 to 2 inch amounts. And you can see the effects of that Canadian air across the northeastern U.S., generally less than 1 inch. Likewise, in the western U.S., you can see the dry conditions behind that cold front. And we've got some subsidence along the front there in Nevada. But out ahead of it, there's that tropical air coming in from the Gulf of California, from old Mexico, 
flowing up to Utah, Wyoming, and we've got precipitable water approaching one inch across much of the central Rockies. Then we've got the 500 millibar Q vectors. We haven't really looked at this in many months because during the summertime, things are convectively driven. That tends to overwhelm the synoptic scale processes. And we do have those in places like Canada, the northern U.S. But look at this. We've got major dynamics in the western U.S. This is something we've not seen in a while. Here's strong mid and upper level forcing. That's going to be upward motion with subsidence on the backside. In between, this suggests the presence of a shortwave, should say a shortwave trough rotating around the east side of that upper level low. So this is going to be 1 p.m. And you can see by 7 p.m., it appears that rotates up into Idaho, Montana, and brings the stronger lift into northwest Montana. And the Storm Prediction Center has issued a couple of mesoscale discussions today. Earlier, they had one for eastern Idaho, pretty close to that trough, and then later in the day, focusing on that slight risk area in northwestern Montana. And we do have our severe thunderstorm watch out for this afternoon and evening for western Montana, basically everywhere west of Lewiston and Bozeman. And there's one last look at that activity. That's an organized storm complex, highly sheared. So this is going to be associated with some long-lived structures. And it appears we've got a wildfire as well in the Salmon River Mountains. In Texas, a few areas of thunderstorm activity. Looks like we've got one complex from Centerville up to Corsicana, along Interstate 45, and where we have that very intense heating west of Fort Worth around Abilene, numerous air mass type thunderstorms developing from Eastland, Ranger, Abilene, all the way up towards Knox City. There's a look at the current temperatures, 111 at Comanche, 111 at Abilene. And I lived there for a couple of years, never saw anything above 105. So that's certainly anomalous. We've got 114 at Vernon, 111 at Childress, and 111 at Alta. So this is some serious heat. That heat also breaking out showers anywhere from Hereford, Amarillo, up towards Canadian. So let's take a look at that forecast. The best thing to do is look at the 500 millibar chart going into next week. And we see the subtropical high migrate a little bit to the north, out around Kansas City and St. Louis. So that's going to spread the heat into parts of the Midwest and eventually into the southeastern U.S. This trough continues progressing to the east and to the northeast, mostly affecting Canada and the northern tier states. As we get into Tuesday and Wednesday, you can see that subtropical high sinking down into the Atlanta area. We start to open up a little bit of westerly flow across the Great Plains, but the flow is still on the weak side. A couple of migratory troughs embedded in that prevailing westerlies moving through, including ridges. So that's going to mean alternating periods of maybe some precip, cooler weather with warm weather. And then going into late next week, kind of a stagnant weather pattern across much of the country. One of those lows closes off in the Corn Belt area. Another subtropical high developing in the Rockies and the Southern Lobe continuing to sit over Georgia and South Carolina. So that is the lowdown on the upper level conditions. So let's look at that forecast. This is the rest of this evening. Strong cold front moving into the eastern Great Basin area and into the Rockies. Begins slowing down a little bit and becoming stationary. Then we go into Saturday. It's going to be a cold, brisk morning across the northeastern U.S., starting out with lows in the 50s and lower 60s. Places like Albany, 56, Scranton, 52, and State College, 54. In the western U.S., we will have a marginal risk setting up for the central Rockies, extending from about Gallup up towards Grand Junction, Denver, and into the Cheyenne area. That's due to that strengthening upper level flow. Some cold overnight lows in the northwest, Boise 59, Spokane 49, Reno 49, but hanging on to 67 at Salt Lake City, still in that tropical air mass. It is going to be continued hot along the Cap Rock into Kansas, 
As we go into afternoon, we're looking at highs around 108 at Childress, up to 102 at Dodge City, 102 at Abilene, and 100 at DFW. There's those storms there in Colorado in the central Rockies. Then we go into Sunday. We can see that cold front makes a little bit of progress into Wyoming and into the western Dakotas, the tail end remaining stationary. The afternoon hours, I well, don't have an afternoon chart, but we'll just kind of use this. We are going to be looking at some rather hot conditions, 104 at Salina, 103 at Pratt, and 102 at Childress. So that's going to be the center of the heat. Then we go into Monday. This cold front makes its way through the Dakotas and into Nebraska. The heat wave starts moving into the Midwest, into parts of Tennessee. Looking for a high of 99 degrees at Nashville, 97 at Kansas City, and 98 at St. Louis. The highs in Texas falling off into the upper 90s. So that is a little bit of good news. There's the map on Tuesday, kind of a stagnant weather pattern. Cold morning in the Rockies, lots of 30s and 40s. The heat rotates anticyclonically into Tennessee. Mississippi and Alabama, we're looking at 100s all across this area right here. Memphis, Nashville, and Birmingham. Temperatures start to increase a little bit in the deserts, up to 104 at Las Vegas and 108 at Phoenix, and that will persist all the way through Thursday. A new cold front making its way through the northwestern U.S., so that will progress into the central U.S. later in the week. And the heat wave settling in across the southeastern U.S., upper 90s, and maybe a couple of isolated 100s across Georgia for later in the week. And this cold front sinks into Texas, Oklahoma, and that will significantly increase the chances for precip going into late week across the southern plains. And that's all we have for this edition of Forecast Lab. Remember, if you want to catch the show on Monday, you need to be a Patreon supporter. So there's the link for that. Otherwise, we'll see you back here on Wednesday for another episode of this program. Hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.